Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Wilmot. I'm the Associate Director of the Ethics Program here at Villanova University. And uh, I'm very happy to have you joining us today for the fifth annual Ethics of War and Peace Conference, this joint project between Villanova and the Military Academy at West Point. <clears throat> I too would like to just extend a word of thanks to our own Professor Mark Wilson for all of his hard work and, and I believe Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Cutright for um, both of their organizational efforts um, for putting this together. I know it's a huge task and it's always extremely impressive what, they, what both these institutions I think pull off uh, each year for this. Um, I think we have a really wonderful schedule of speakers and, and I hope everyone enjoys the day and, and has a wonderful experience and please make sure to join us tomorrow as well for the, the sessions. They should be, uh, I think, really uh, great talks tomorrow as well. I would now like to introduce the speaker and respondent for our first plenary event. The title of our first paper is Leaving Afghanistan, Arguments Pro and Con. It will be presented by Professor Kenneth Himes, who is joining us from the Theology Department at Boston College. His research interests include the history of Catholic social teaching, the role of the U.S. Catholic community in American social reform, the ethics of warfare, and the relationship of religion and politics in the nation's public life. His recent publications include Targeted Killing and the Ethics of Drone Warfare, Humanitarian Intervention and the Just War Tradition, and Christianity and the Political Order, Conflict, Cooptation, and Cooperation. He has been a past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America and a past editor of New Theology Review. For several years, he acted as theological consultant for the Office of Social Development and World Peace at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Responding to Professor Himes is our own Professor Jean McCarraher, a historian from our Department of Humanities. Jean has published in a wide array of journals, including the Journal of, His of the History Historical Society, modern theology, and modern intellectual history. He's an accomplished essayist whose work has appeared in The Baffler, The Hedgehog Review, Raritan, and The Chicago Tribune. He has been a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Council of Learned Societies. He is also the author of two books, Christian Critics, Religion and the Impasse in Modern American Social Thought, and most recently, Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity. After McCar Professor McCarraher's response, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to both of our speakers. Well, good morning. One of the things that will become evident uh, very quickly to you is uh, this is not a Philadelphia accent you're listening to. <laughs> Uh, this is a Brooklyn accent, uh, the way God wanted English to be spoken. Uh, uh, let me also begin with one slight revision. This won't be a surprise to Gene, he got the paper, but uh, the title of the talk is not exactly what is in your programs. That's not in any way due to any error on Mark's part. It was just I sent him a title, and then when I started writing the paper, I realized I wasn't doing what the title says. So uh, the, the revised title is this, Ending the War in Afghanistan, Reflections from the Just War Tradition. But what I'm not going to do that perhaps the earlier title suggested is, I'm not going to lay out a topology of arguments pro and con. There are various ways that one can understand the political moral tradition that we refer to as the just war. Like any tradition, it admits of multiple interpretations or theories, so no one theory encapsulates the entire tradition. My view tends to downplay the tradition as a set of norms that must be applied like a checklist to determine the morality of a given war. Though I do not deny there are important moral norms in the tradition. I also do not see the tradition as a virtue ethic for warriors or policymakers. Though again, I do not deny there are virtues central to the tradition. Nor is the tradition a framework for a utilitarian ethic that seeks to maximize overall beneficial outcomes 
over negative consequences. Although an assessment of likely outcomes of actions is integral to certain elements of the just war tradition. I think of the just war tradition largely as a framework for how to have a reasonable and comprehensive conversation about the morality of employing armed force between political institutions or movements. The just war tradition does not settle differences between disputants, but lays out the range of topics that disputants need to address in any satisfactory way if they are to engage in morally responsible argument. Let me turn to the specific issue of ending the war in Afghanistan. In what follows, my remarks will be presented under four main headings. A brief historical overview of US strategy in Afghanistan, followed by some remarks about the situations of both the US and the Taliban at this point in time. Third, some comments about jus post bellum in Afghanistan, and I will conclude with some lessons from a just war perspective for the future of the US and war. Let me begin, however, with just a little background for those who are not as familiar with Afghanistan uh, as perhaps some of the others here are. This past October, the US war in Afghanistan turned 17. Afghanistan is about the size of Texas with an estimated population of 33 million people. That population is very dispersed. Only six cities in Afghanistan have a population over 100,000. In fact, if you add the 25 largest cities in Afghanistan, the total makes up only 20% of the population. So unlike the situation in Iraq, where Baghdad alone accounts for 25% of the national population, Afghanistan is a much more diffused population to protect or control. There are a variety of tribes and ethnic groups, Pashtuns, Tajik, Hazara, Uzbek, among the biggest. Pashtuns are the largest, located largely in the south. The Tajiks, the second largest, located mainly in the north. There are about 15 million Pashtuns within Afghanistan, of about a 30 to 35 million more Pashtuns in Pakistan. The border between those two countries means quite little to Pashtuns. Economically, Afghanistan is consistently in the bottom 10 of least economically developed nations using the UN Development Index. It ranks high in the rate of corruption. Illiteracy is somewhere around 60% of the population, higher for women. Life expectancy averages in the 50s, with the third highest mortality for children under five. Large percentages of people do not have adequate food or sanitized water to drink. The average monthly household income is 165 US dollars per month. So with that as just a little background to set the scene, an overview of US strategy. Before John Kerry became Secretary of State, when he was still in the Senate, he visited Afghanistan and upon his return gave a speech before the Council on Foreign Relations. He spoke of three legs necessary for Afghanistan to be stabilized. Militarily secure, an efficient and non-corrupt government, and thirdly, economic development. He noted that the military situation might improve with increasing numbers in the early years of the Obama administration. But he expressed skepticism that there would be any improvement in governance and worried that economic development would entail huge costs and not be effectively delivered. 
His question at the end of the speech was, how can you go forward with the first leg of military security if the other two legs are missing? Would US policy work? Kerry's speech came at a time of intense debate within the Obama administration that took place in 2009. Put somewhat simply, it was a debate about whether to pursue a counterinsurgency or counterterrorism strategy. The counterterrorism strategy was pushed by Vice President Joe Biden. In this approach, a reduced number of several thousand American forces would continue to strike against Al Qaeda and the Islamic State using special ops forces, drones, and partnering with the best trained African units, Afghan units. The counterinsurgency strategy, commonly known by the acronym COIN, was favored by General Stanley McChrystal, who at the time was the top commander in Afghanistan. And this involved a substantial commitment to training Afghan forces, a surge in American troop numbers, and a focus on winning over the civilian population to the Kabul government. The aim would be not just the defeat of Al-Qaeda, but of the Taliban, and the creation of an effective national government. In the end, Obama sided with the proponents of counterinsurgency. According to McChrystal, it would be about a year, or take about a year, to stop the momentum of the Taliban at the time. There would be another year for the US forces to gain military momentum. And then approximately five years more to build a government and a security force that could run and protect the nation. That prediction of seven years for the success of the counterinsurgency strategy was made in 2009. Of course, the Obama administration inherited the situation from the Bush administration. What began as a response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11 by Al-Qaeda entailed a punitive assault on the Taliban regime for providing a safe haven for terrorists. Once that government was overthrown, however, the Bush administration was less than sure-footed in its approach. Many in the Bush White House were reluctant to get into what was called nation building, but the alternative was unclear in the situation. In the spring of 2002, President Bush gave a speech about bringing a Marshall Plan to Afghanistan, recalling the US effort to rebuild Europe after World War II. Had that been done, it would, it would have meant something on the order of $90 billion in aid to Afghanistan using 2002 dollars. In fact, the US was giving less than $1 billion at the time. And less than a year later, the US began its military engagement in Iraq. From then on, Afghanistan suffered from what one commentator has called strategic neglect. Despite the efforts of the Obama administration to make Afghanistan a focal point of its concern, we did not see the success of COIN in advancing the situation. By the time the Trump administration came upon the scene, there was a weariness in Washington with Afghanistan. Donald Trump came to the White House as a harsh critic of US policy in Afghanistan and had promised to withdraw US troops from the conflict. However, during that first summer of his presidency, Trump gave a nationally televised speech in which he acknowledged that he was turning against his original instinct to pull out of the war. Then, after lambasting the policy of Obama, he announced an alleged new policy that sounded a good deal similar to what the Obama administration had been doing in the final years of that presidency. 
Trump stated he would send more troops, put more pressure on Pakistan to assist in combating the Taliban, and that U.S. forces would be restricted to training Afghan forces and conducting counter-terrorist operations. He also promised that he would launch an intense diplomatic initiative, despite the fact that at the time, the U.S. had no ambassador in Kabul, and Trump had done away with the Office of Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Critics of the Trump policy saw him as leaning toward an open-ended commitment of a U.S. presence, of a U.S. presence, but with no stated criteria to measure success and no hint of a timetable for withdrawal, contradicting his campaign promises. Supporters of his policy suggested he was sending a message to the Taliban that the U.S. would not abandon Kabul and that the acknowledged military stalemate would not change due to the U.S. ending its commitment. Few, if any, supporters argued that the commitment of more troops would make a difference on the ground or turn the tide in favor of the Kabul government. In short, there was no reasonable hope of success militarily that justified sending the additional troops. It was mainly a symbolic gesture to indicate U.S. resolve. So where are we now? At the end of this past January, the U.S. intelligence community issued a non-classified worldwide threat assessment that barely mentioned Afghanistan. It was dealt with by a single paragraph. They labeled the situation there a stalemate. Journalists on location report that American military commanders have stopped talking about winning in Afghanistan. How could the president, how could the present 14,000 troops do what 110,000 could not. For almost two years now, the Taliban have held more territory than at any time since the U.S. invaded. In many places, the Afghan government controls only the district headquarters and military barracks, while the rest is contested or controlled by the Taliban. The Afghan army has suffered grievously. It is failing to meet its replacement goals, and there is much suspicion over desertion numbers by both army and police. Both the recruitment and desertion numbers are now classified as secret. Yet the Taliban also have weaknesses. They have alienated many Afghans by their terror tactics. They remain largely a Pashtun movement with little role for non-Pashtuns. Their ideology is seen as harsh and unappealing, particularly among urban residents, and they are viewed as too reliant upon Pakistan, a less than admired neighbor among many Afghans. As Seth Jones, the former plans officer and senior advisor for the commanding general of U.S. Special Ops in Afghanistan has suggested, the Taliban is too weak for victory, but too strong to defeat. He believes the Taliban may well believe their best option is a negotiated settlement. He also maintains that both Washington and Kabul, unlikely to gain outright victory, should also be serious about a political, not military, conclusion to the war. So a word about the U.S. situation at present and the Taliban situation at present. Three administrations have tried multiple strategies to defeat the Taliban and to build an effective, non-corrupt, and legitimate Afghan government that has the loyalty of the majority of its citizens. 
After 18 years, the consensus of both the U.S. intelligence community and the military commanders is that we have struggled to a military stalemate, and the desired Afghan state shows little signs of emerging. In the past, political consultations, the 2001 Bonn Agreement and the 2004 Constitutional Convention, that looked at Afghanistan's future, both of these excluded the Taliban at the insistence of the United States. What this exclusion meant is that the Taliban had no political voice and therefore no political stake in deciding the nation's future. And so it fed an insurgency that, as the years have shown, would make any future extremely difficult to attain. The Obama surge to 100,000 U.S. troops, along with 40,000 other troops from NATO nations, did not defeat or even debilitate the Taliban over the long term. Later in his administration, Obama, Obama drew down the U.S. commitment to 10,000 troops in a counter-terrorist strategy, abandoning the COIN approach. Early in his administration, Trump increased the number of troops by about 50 percent. He intensified the air war and gave his commanders greater leeway to attack the Taliban. Yet, the Taliban are not significantly weakened. Indeed, the situation has been described as an eroding stalemate in which the Kabul government slowly loses territory to the Taliban. If one were to point out the major difference between what Trump and what Obama's final policy was, it would be the absence in Trump's speech of a stated timetable for drawing down troops. That was meant to make clear to the Taliban that they cannot simply wait out the American presence. Still, as many in Washington believe, as well as many in Afghanistan, this is a president not known for patience, who self-admittedly went against his own instincts and who grew tired of military advice from both H.R. McMaster and James Mattis, his former National Security Advisor and Secretary of Defense. And so less than a year after the announced initial strategy, in June of 2018, Secretary of State Pompeo made it explicit that the U.S. was willing to put its troop deployment on the negotiating table, which was the Taliban's primary interest. Not long after that, the U.S. sent a State Department official to meet directly with Taliban negotiators in Doha, Qatar. Then in the fall, the Trump administration appointed Ambassador Khalilzad to be the lead representative at the Doha talks. Those talks have led to a framework that might bring about a political settlement to the longest American war in history. On the other side of the negotiations are the Taliban. Although Al-Qaeda and the Taliban cooperated and shared funding, they are distinct groups. The former is a non-Afghan movement focused on international terrorism, while the latter is an Afghan-Pakistani group whose primary aim is to drive foreign troops out of Afghanistan and to spread Islamic rule in Pakistan. In other words, while Al-Qaeda and some of the most extreme insurgents must be beaten or contained, the majority of Taliban is not committed to a globalist agenda. They share conservative beliefs and have strong views about what is a just social order. Their rallying cry is to expel foreign invaders, and they are also dissatisfied with the present Afghan government 
and Afghan politics, which they view as corrupt and illegitimate because of its dependence upon the U.S. Yet, the Taliban is a different organization today than it was in the 1990s. Part of that difference is a willingness to recognize that their insurgency can prevent some things from happening, but it cannot create the things they desire most. Their reason for this is not just that it cannot simply defeat the Western military presence. The Taliban are also aware that they have weaknesses that hinder the success of their agenda. First, their ideology is too extreme for most Afghans. Many Afghans, especially the 20% of urban residents, approve of the use of modern technology, broader participation politically that includes women voting and holding public office, as well as the education of young women. Second, the Taliban leadership structure is too closely tied to the Pashtun ethnic group. They are also seen as too dependent on allies such as Pakistan, who are not viewed favorably by the majority non-Pashtun Afghans. Third, in their resistance to the U.S. counterinsurgency, the Taliban adopted brutal tactics that have killed tens of thousands of innocent Afghan civilians and alienated many more. The vast majority of Afghans do not see the Taliban as moderates. Fourth, the Taliban suffer from their own linkage to corruption due to their involvement in the drug trade that has helped finance their operations. Hence, while the Taliban can continue to wage an insurgency, the odds of overthrowing the government remain less than even. When they take over territory that is not rural, they cannot hold it. But since they can control rural areas, there is some leverage for negotiating a political settlement. Perhaps the clearest sign that the Taliban are interested in serious negotiations was the appointment of Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradur as their chief negotiator in Doha. He was one of the founding leaders of the Taliban movement and was a trusted lieutenant for many years to the supreme leader, Mullah Muhammad Omar. It was also encouraging that Pakistan, Pakistan's security and military leadership were willing to release Baradur, who was under their detention, in order for him to pursue a settlement, when in 2010, they had detained him for doing that very thing. This suggests that Pakistan will be supportive of a settlement if its concerns are addressed. While the Doha talks remain at a stage where a settlement is hardly assured, press reports suggest that the Taliban is seriously engaged in the negotiating process. Some just just postbellum concerns. Achieving a measure of peace is central to the purpose of the just war tradition. Peace, however, is not to be equated with the mere absence of war. In Catholic teaching, as well as many other moral traditions, peace is understood as the fruit of justice. In Catholic teaching, justice and peace entail the creation of a social order whereby people may live in a rightly ordered political community. By a political community that is rightly ordered, I mean the construction of an exterior space through institutions and practices that permit men and women to live together in a measure of freedom, justice oriented to the common good. 
From the perspective of the US postbellum framework, there is a concern that ending the US role in the conflict in Afghanistan ought not be done in a manner that makes a genuine peace unattainable or even less likely. Therefore, what might we hope for in terms of a negotiating process that brings an end to the tragic history of the US intervention in Afghanistan? First, the Afghan war is best analyzed on three levels. There is a war among Afghans with the Taliban desiring to retain control or regain control of the nation. There's a competition within Afghanistan of rivals for regional influence that includes India, Iran, Pakistan, and Russia. And thirdly, there's an international struggle against terrorism and the possibility of sanctuaries for terrorists dependent on how those first two conflicts get worked out. The Taliban's role in a future administration is key. The Taliban's observance of the June 2017 ceasefire and their willingness to reopen direct talks with the United States has indicated an interest in peace. Any durable peace will require that the Taliban become a political party within the Afghan nation that is governed under a constitution that protects basic rights for all Afghans. The Taliban seeks the departure of foreign military, but this will take time. Just how much time is one of the central issues to be resolved for the longer the time, the less enthused the Taliban will be about negotiations. But the news coming out of Doha is that they want a timetable for US withdrawal, but they are not demanding an established end date. Securing an enforcement mechanism for any deal is going to be a tough issue. Even if the US and other NATO forces depart, some external military presence, perhaps from an alliance of other Muslim nations, will be needed for a time to avoid a return to civil war and to protect against the Taliban coup. The Taliban have indicated they do not want to see their country turn into another Syria. The main US goal in any settlement should reflect the original rationale for the intervention, namely the end to providing a safe haven for global terrorists. Providing incentives to the tribal chiefs who run the rural territories of the country may be the best way to ensure that terrorist networks do not have a significant presence in Afghanistan. Remember, too, the Taliban have, appro have opposed the presence of ISIS-K in the nation. They have not forgotten what brought the US into Afghanistan, and they do not want to provide a rationale for the US military to come back once they have left. The Taliban are a traditionalist and nationalist group. They do not have transnational ambitions. Because the aims and means available to the US at this point are limited, that does not mean because we cannot do everything, we ought, not, we ought to do nothing. The second goal for the US in any settlement is that the Afghan government, however constituted, should be a constitutional government. And it should be secure enough to deter a coup attempt or break down into civil war. That means a conditional timetable for withdrawal and the implementation of some security measures, either a residual US rapid response force near Kabul, an adequate Afghan army, or an international observer force composed of Muslim military. In the end, however, the real factor in securing Afghan gov an Afghan government will be if that government effectively promotes economic development 
for the people of the nation. Military force is a very limited use in forging loyalty to a government. It may keep enemies of the state at bay, but the genuine need is for a post-settlement government that can make the lives of the Afghan people noticeably better. As one female U.S. development worker has observed, there is a need to replace the uniform presence with a non-uniformed presence. But there is going to be a need to have one with the other for some time after a settlement. The peace settlement requires the U.S., the Taliban, and the Afghan government to find a path that all three parties trust will secure their major concerns. Yet outside forces can disrupt the peace process or any outcome of the process. A hopeful sign is that the interests of these outside parties actually appear to be aligning with a political solution for the war, especially since China has become an economic force in the region. China is now investing heavily in Pakistan, and both nations want stability in order to guarantee that investment. Bringing stability to Afghanistan is now seen as an important piece in economic development strategies by China and Pakistan for the region. Furthermore, having Taliban leaders in the Afghan government that Pakistan knows and has cooperated with over the decades will help alleviate Islamabad's anxieties about India's influence in a post-settlement Afghanistan. Dealing with this is crucial since Pakistan is the potential number one spoiler of any peace settlement. Not unlike the Taliban, Iran, Russia, and China also want assurances that American military forces will not be a permanent presence in Afghanistan. What would certainly not garner support from other parties, as well as the Taliban, would be a security system premised on a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the present Afghan government that it finances nor is any possibility of permanent American military bases feasible in a final settlement. In sum, the pieces are potentially in place to forge a settlement if the parties are willing to negotiate in good faith and accept compromise. Investing in a negotiating process is the morally responsible strategy for the United States. A unilateral withdrawal owing to impatience or frustration would lead to the end of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, but it would not mean the end of war in Afghanistan. In closing, a just war perspective on the future of the U.S. in war. One of the evolutions within the Catholic Church's understanding of the just war tradition has been a move towards greater hesitancy in approving a resort to arms. At least since Pope Pius XII's cautions about the widespread change caused by the means of modern warfare, or the widespread damage caused by the means of modern warfare, at least since then, there has been a trend in papal reflections on the need to narrow the possible justifications cited to justify war. Whether one articulates this growing skepticism about the benefits of war in the language of prima facie duties to avoid war, or a presumption against war, or some shortened list of what would count as a just cause, there is an unmistakable lesson that even if war can sometimes be justifiable, the Catholic tradition has come to conclude we have resorted to it too easily and hastily. 
War is an exceptional undertaking, and it ought not be a regular feature of state action. It is not an acceptable way to bring about regime change or democracy. And it is not to be continued for the sake of avoiding damage to one's reputation or credibility. What we have seen in Afghanistan and later on in Iraq is a shifting case for just cause in going to war and continuing in war. Afghanistan was about the removing, removing the threat that Al-Qaeda posed by its program of global terrorism. However, Afghanistan is no longer the key location in the fight against terrorism in general, or even Al-Qaeda in particular. And that has been the case for some time now. What has happened is that the goal of democratization and societal transformation, that is, nation building, has come to dominate the strategy of the US in Afghanistan. Once that goal became predominant, it has limited the ability of the United States to withdraw in a timely way or to accept a politically compromised outcome. The cause of war was cast in such broad and vague terms that the US now feels it necessary to keep fighting to deliver on an ambition that is unrealistic. Seeking to establish as the goal of war a stable democracy, no matter how inhospitable to democracy the history, institutions, and culture of Afghanistan are, was the error. The original goal of intervention was clear and circumscribed. Al-Qaeda was to be rooted out from its safe havens and destroyed. And the repressive Taliban government that had given protection to Al-Qaeda was to be punished. That was a doable goal that our military could accomplish. And it was arguably a just cause for the military intervention. The just war tradition posits the existence of a reasonable hope of success as another element in weighing the wisdom and justice of going to war. We are now in Afghanistan with no clear probability, or many would say even likelihood, of success. Continuing a war after 18 years on the basis of a wisp of hope that victory is just over the horizon is not reasonable. As one wag has put it, a horizon is an imaginary line that recedes the closer you get to it. There is a temptation after the initial just aim is lost sight of or remains beyond accomplishment to continue to fight on for the sake of upholding a nation's self-understanding of its role in world order. So war is prosecuted far beyond the burden that would have been deemed disproportionate prior to the onset of conflict. More than 2,400 US military have been killed. More than 20,000 injured. According to estimates by the United Nations, more than 20,000 Afghan civilians have been killed, with another 50,000 injured in just the last 10 years. More than 62,000 Afghan soldiers and police have died. In 2016, more than 6,000 Afghan soldiers and police were killed in just that year. Losses that US generals have called unsustainable. In 2017 and 2018, the figures were classified secret by the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Monetarily, the US has spent $930 billion, give or take a few million, on the war. That figure, according to Brown University's Cost of War Project, could go as high as two trillion when long-term costs 
are factored in. There is a final issue about the justice of this war that raises questions for American democracy and the obligations of US citizenship. Next year, the incoming plebes at West Point and the freshmen at Villanova will likely be made up largely of 18-year-olds who will never have lived in America that is not at war. The danger is that we will have a generation in which war is not the exceptional option born out of necessity and moral duty, but it is an ongoing feature of American life. The U.S. has the capacity to wage war with minimal disruption to the lives of most of its citizens. The size of the American economy and our ability to fight war on credit. Remember, almost the entire cost of the Afghan campaign has been financed by taking on future debt. That means that there is little economic impact from the, for the war on present citizens. The technological developments in weaponry and fighting have minimized American casualties so that American citizens are now spared the sight of grieving spouses and children welcoming home caskets. Lastly, an all-volunteer military distances much of American society from the experience, the stories, the physical injuries, the emotional trauma and death that our professional warriors encounter. For 18 years, our army has been at war, but our country has not. Even after all these years, less than 1% of the US population has served in Afghanistan or Iraq. The lack of public debate, even in Congress, is a testament to what a New York Times editorial referred to as our national credulity or passivity about our nation being at war. The general lack of searching conversation and public interest is a danger. For it is a true moral hazard when our nation's leadership knows that it can resort to war without the citizenry being disturbed. The way that Americans experience war is unlikely to change. But without being confronted by the realities of war, the general public will not demand accountability from leaders nor pressure them to bring a just end to war. Without that pressure, Congress has stood ambivalent for years about acting. And so war has become not the exception, but the rule in American life. For that to be America's future is a grievous blow to the role of the just war tradition in public discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Himes. I'd like us now to, to welcome um, Professor McCarraher. And after Professor McCarraher speaks, there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, I think the plan is to use the microphone, but we're a small enough room we could see. Um, but if, if there is a microphone, that will be available. And I'll generally let our, our two speakers kind of uh, take questions as it comes up. G? In The Quiet American, Graham Greene's prescient 1955 novel about the incipient US involvement in Vietnam, we're guided by the narrator, Thomas Fowler, a sharp-eyed and world-weary British journalist who's covering the ferocious and failing French military effort to hold on to their colony. Fowler befriends Alden Pyle, an earnest and idealistic young American who, it turns out, is a CIA operative. Shaped by an utter lack of familiarity with Vietnamese history and culture, Pyle's efforts to create a third force in Vietnam that is neither colonialist nor communist winds up getting quite a lot of innocent people killed. 
And at one point, Fowler muses on the bloody consequences of his friend's naivety. Quote, I never knew a man who had better motives for all the trouble he caused. Someday, if someone writes the equivalent of the quiet American for the war in Afghanistan, whoever, write, whoever does might want to consider using that line as the epigram at the front of the book. The mission there has evolved from apprehending Osama bin Laden and other terrorists into building a liberal democracy and developing the economy, commendable motives, at least ostensibly. And 17 years of war and occupation have ensued. In October, the Afghan war will turn 18, which means it will be old enough to vote. As Ken recounts the statistics, what have been the results? A thoroughly corrupt and dysfunctional government, high rates of illiteracy and child mortality, and inadequate access to food and drinking water. The Taliban hold more territory now than they did at the time of the invasion in October 2001. Recruitment and desertion figures for the Afghan army are classified, read awful, and a succession of U.S. military strategies, strategies has not issued in victory. Rather, they've delivered strategic neglect, stalemate, or eroding stalemate, depending on which anodyne bureaucratic euphemism you prefer. Oh, and the cost? Somewhere between one and two trillion dollars. That's a high price for all the trouble we've caused, not to mention the price that the Afghans have been forced to pay. At least we don't have another William Westmoreland telling us there's light at the end of the tunnel. What is at the end of the tunnel? After providing a lucid and nuanced overview of the history and current geopolitical situation in the region, one that I think could have stretched back into the late 1970s. Ken suggests that if it isn't the brightest light at the tunnel's end, at least it's not a terrifying darkness. Of the three end games that he sketches, the third he contends is the most morally responsible at this moment, namely liquidating terrorist enclaves and allowing, quote, national governance to be worked out by the Afghan people within a constitutional framework that ensures basic rights for all, end quote. I'm skeptical, both of the realization of that scenario and of its coherence, because I detect a tension in Ken's account that points, I think, to a larger incoherence of US policy that I want to address in a moment. If one follows the reportage of Ahmed Rashid, a Pakistani journalist who has written about Afghanistan for the Wall Street Journal, The Nation, and the New York Review of Books. The current U.S. negotiations with the Taliban being conducted in Qatar by Special Envoy Zalmay, Zalmay Khalilzad look very much to me like those conducted in Paris in the early 1970s by Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. What presents itself as an effort to achieve an elusive but real peace is really an attempt to extricate the U.S. from an impossible situation with as much saving of face as possible. While Khalilzad and the Taliban have apparently agreed on a timetable for U.S. military withdrawal, a Taliban pledge to end its relationships with terrorist groups, and a commitment to what Khalilzad calls intra-Afghan dialogue, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani is vehemently suspicious, especially since the Taliban refused to hold direct talks with its government. According to Rashid, Ghani's adamantine position doesn't augur well for the dialogue, and neither does the fact that the Taliban have been cultivating relationships with Pakistan, China, Russia, and Iran the latter two of which have provided logistical support for Taliban fighters. Moreover, Ken reflects elsewhere in his paper that what he, I think rightly, dubs the fateful error in US strategy was to seek, quote, a stable democracy, no matter how inhospitable to democracy the history, institutions, and culture of Afghanistan are, end quote. Yet isn't a stable democracy precisely what the third endgame envisions? Quote, a constitutional framework that ensures basic rights for all, 
that would in turn, quote, allow national governance to be worked out by the Afghan people. My fear is that even Ken's relatively benign third option will keep the U.S. in Afghanistan for quite a long time to come. So given the immediate and long-term obstacles that stand in the way of such governance, and assuming that Ken and I agree that the second endgame that he outlines is impossible, namely a more or less permanent U.S. military commitment, I would ask, is the first endgame, unilateral withdrawal of all U.S. forces, really so morally irresponsible? More important, I think that Ken's third scenario reflects a broader and more fundamental incoherence about U.S. foreign policy, not only in Afghanistan, but also around the world. And here I want to echo and elaborate on the concerns he voices at the end of his paper, namely the prolongation of wars, quote, on the basis of the need to avoid defeat, and the metamorphosis of war from an exceptional undertaking into what he calls an ongoing feature of life. A change that's been enabled, he rightly points out, by the insulation of American citizens from the monetary and human costs of combat. Now, I would follow here a long line of historians, from William Appleman Williams and Gabriel Kolko to Andrew Basevich and Andrews, Anders Stephenson and Walter Hickson, in conceiving of U.S. foreign and military policy as imperial policy, riven with economic, geopolitical, and idealistic motives. That last, however, an especially toxic brew of vainglory and self-delusion and denial. Legitimated by an evolving rhetoric of city on a hill, manifest destiny, exceptionalism, good Samaritan, etc., etc., U.S. imperial policy has so often conveyed an image of the United States as anointed by God or capital H history as the indispensable nation, in Madeleine Albright's words, the only hope for freedom, prosperity, and goodness in the world, whose anointment grants us an inviolable right and duty to define what's good for others and to deliver it, even if they don't want it. I want to suggest that we won't even begin to grapple with Ken's concerns until we acknowledge that history and its legacy. That is, until we disenchant ourselves of the notion that the United States is an instrument of divine or historic will. Beguiled by this belief, which I don't think has been cynical for the most part, I think it's been ideological, which means it's all the more indomitable. U.S. imperial policy has so often been conducted under the assumption that our economic interests and what used to be called the civilizing mission are happily in accord. Afghanistan has been a textbook example, and not only because of oil and natural gas, subjects which American pundits dismiss as left-wing boogeymen, but which Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl were never shy about mentioning. As the American expatriate journalist Susie Hansen describes it in her remarkable book, Notes on a Foreign Country, a volume that should be required reading in any international relations class, the U.S. occupation has consisted, in real terms, of a vanity fair of avarice and ambition and condescending benevolence. Centered in Kabul, Contractors, financiers, entrepreneurs, aid workers, administrators, and soldiers were busy constructing an urban edifice of high-rises, shiny grocery and department stores, palatial residences, tony restaurants and nightclubs, all paying dividends for the war profiteers and Afghan elites who were busy buying up waterfront property in Dubai for the day that Kabul eventually fell. And over it all presided the likes of Carl Eikenberry, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan from 2009 to 2011, quote, seeming to believe, as Hansen observed, that his kindness was all that really mattered. What went on in the mountains and villages outside of Kabul? Cavalierly uninterested in what Afghans wanted, but committed to visions of development straight from the pages of New York Times blowhards like Thomas Friedman, Aid workers and contractors, as the Afghan writer Kez Akbar Omar wrote in the Times in May 2013, 
The Americans spent billions building cobblestone streets that, quote, our donkeys cannot walk on, and teaching farmers to, quote, grow hot red peppers that Afghans do not like to eat. Representing the neoliberal stage of American empire, the U.S. military and diplomatic corps in Afghanistan remain quick to remind us that our presence there is emblematic of a desire to overcome the legacy of colonial rule, which is why their policy has fostered a synergy of vanity, superficial inclusiveness, and unfettered capitalism. As the journalist Vanessa Ghazari puts it in The, Goods, in the Tender Soldier, the prevailing ideological matrix of U.S. policy in Afghanistan and elsewhere is increasingly that of, quote, American exceptionalism tempered by the political correctness of a post-colonial globalized age and driven by a ravenous hunger for profit, end quote. The portrait of the U.S. occupation drawn by Ghazari, Hansen, and others underscores the interdependence of the military apparatus and corporate business. That lucrative nexus of Mars and Mammon that President Dwight Eisenhower famously dubbed the military-industrial complex. The reliance of U.S. capitalism on military spending since the Second World War is or should be a truism, but it seldom features in discussions of why war has become, in Ken's words, an ongoing feature of life. Indeed, war and preparation for war and the maintenance of a global military network have constituted an integral element of American economic and political life for over half a century, and I would argue even longer. Perceiving, quote, empire as a way of life, as Williams put it, means a serious reckoning with the military-industrial complex, something that I doubt most Americans are willing or ready to undertake. What Ken calls the lack of searching conversation about American involvements overseas what he criticizes is not just a moral fault, it's a structural imperative of our political economy. It's essential that we don't talk about these things. But political economy isn't the only reason why the U.S. can't admit the most glaringly obvious defeat or failure. Admitting defeat or failure would also mean conceding that one of the foundations of U.S. foreign policy is delusional. It would mean realizing that we are not the curators of freedom, prosperity, and goodness, and that we do not enjoy the mandate of heaven or of history. That's a hard recognition. But if we want to stop compounding defeat with a desperate need to save face, and if we want to start tallying the real fiscal, moral, and human costs of empire, it's unavoidable. I don't know what Americans would think about their role in the world if they relinquished this fantasy, one which I fear they won't be renouncing anytime soon. What I do know is that as much as we say we want to understand the Afghans, or the Iraqis, or the Somalis, or the Vietnamese, or the Filipinos, or any of the other people who've been the unwilling recipients of American self-regard, Perhaps the people we most need to understand is ourselves. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor McCarraher. All right, everybody, we have a good 15, 20 minutes-ish for some questions and conversation. And uh, I think if, if you all are comfortable, I think, are your microphones? Um, I'm, yeah, we'll have the microphone passed around, so and would you all, do you all want me to, to call out on people or would you all prefer to handle that yourselves? What do you feel? You're the boss. All right, all right, all right. I'll, who, uh, okay, Professor Betts. I found you both most interesting, enlightening, intelligent. I'm glad I don't have to work for the U.S. government because I'd have to choose between you and you are both so good, I don't know how to do that without a lot of further investigation. But at any rate, my question is this. I remember near the beginning of the war, there was talk about the traditional Afghani way of governing in a loya herga, is, do I have the phrase right? And that meant that all the tribal chiefs 
came together, I, I suppose, in one central place, maybe the capital, and they decided things for themselves. And I think after the war began, one was held, and they wanted the king of Afghanistan to come back from exile because he had a chance of making things better, but the United States put its, pardon me if I call him a goon, but it's, uh, our goon in his place. I don't remember that the man we put in his place was admirable in the slightest. Can you tell me what you know about the possibilities of a lawyer, Herga, among the people themselves settling all this? Uh, nothing on this end. <laughs> I, I would just say one thing. I think it's an interesting <laughs> point, and that is uh, Afghanistan has never fun the, the real thing about Afghanistan is not so much democracy. It's never had a national government. It really doesn't focus and work as a centralized national government. And that's why I, uh, I agree with, I, I want to say I agree with Gene about some of his you know, maybe I'm, being a Franciscan, maybe I'm supposed to be optimistic, that I, I'm trying to see a reasonable hope of success here. Maybe Gene's skepticism is, is valid, but I do want to clarify one point. I think when we talk about the need for a constitutional government, it's not the same as a stable democracy. There are other forms of government that could be stable and could be more congenial to Afghan customs and ways and their culture, uh, and it could function with privileged places for gatherings of tribal elders. It could function with some sort of ways of bringing together the various tribes. A big part of Afghanistan's problem is tribal rivalry and ethnic group rivalry. And even within the Taliban, that's true. Uh, Ghani represents one branch of uh, Pashtuns. And there are other brands of Pashtuns that resent uh, Ghani. Ghani represents the more urbanized elite forms of the Pashtuns. Most of the fighters of the Taliban are the mountainous rural Pashtuns. And they have a certain resentment to their own fellow tribe members. So there's, there's kind of layers on layers here is what I'm saying. And I think the issue may be we can think about constitutional government, and by, what I mean by that is securing some essential or basic rights and protections for people, especially for women uh, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. But that doesn't necessarily mean we need some sort of stable national democracy the way we tend to think about democracy. It's just that we have some sort of functioning government that may practice a lot, lot more decentralization than most of us think about when we think about a national government. Because it's just the nature of Afghanistan uh, that I think uh, Gene has so you know, well put. This is, you have to look at this with uh, someone like Gene's historical eye to realize there are deep-seated issues here that we can't resolve. It simply is beyond US competence to resolve. But it doesn't mean that we cannot try and put in some sort of constitutional-based government, even if it's not a very centralized national government. Please, back here. Uh, good morning, I'm Chris Antal. I'm a chaplain at the VA Medical Center here in Philadelphia. I served as an army chaplain. I was in Afghanistan. I uh, feel very sad right now just listening to this history. Um, feel uh, disgusted and uh, grateful for the space that you've opened up here. I have two questions. Um, the first is um, related to the disengaged citizenry, the ambivalent Congress, um, which is responsible really for command and control over the people in this room in uniform. Uh, how did we let this happen? And I speak to you, Professor Heim, as one clergy person to another, citizens of the United States. Where has the religious community been these 18 years? The second question I have has to do with um, Pakistan and loose nukes and the oral, moral argument that 
the U.S. ought to maintain a base in Afghanistan in order to ensure the nuclear weapons in Pakistan don't fall into the hands of people who will create a catastrophic nuclear exchange between the country that will have global implications. Or perhaps bring one of those weapons to the United States and detonate it as a dirty bomb. That was the only moral argument I could think for maintaining a military presence uh, in Afghanistan, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'll just speak as a humble historian. Um, where has religion been? A wall, uh, for the most part. And I think that, uh, at least among Protestant evangelicals, it's because they're bought and paid for. Uh, Protestant evangelicalism is the ideological and social basis, I think, for this kind of Christian nationalism, which, uh, so in other words, to many Protestant evangelicals, the United States and the will of God are simply indistinguishable. Uh, and so it, it's as though, I think, to them, the U.S. military is, the, is an arm of God. And, and I, I'm not exaggerating. I don't think that's hyperbole. Um, so I think, I think a lot of sectors of American religion have signed on. They're, they're bought and paid for, uh, as I said. So I think that in a lot of ways, looking to the official denominational establishments for any kind of resistance is futile. Uh, it, it, is, it is going to have to come from, uh, as they say, uh, from below, not, not from above. Um, as, as to the question, I guess more generally, of, about where, how we got here, uh, well, I could say you could take my course in American Empire, which I'm teaching this spring. Um, we've, been com we've been coming here, look, I, I could give you the meta-narrative. I mean, we've been coming here since the Puritans arrived. Uh, and, as, and especially, I think, over the last hundred years, as, as Williams puts it, I think, in that pithy phrase, we're used to empire as a way of life. It, it's, it's, man, it has done really well for us. And, and if we really had to deal with that, the sacrifices and the change in the way of life that we would have to undergo, I, I think are unimaginable. E e even to people like me, I, th I think it's unimaginable, uh, which is why you know, we'd rather not think about it. That, that's why I'm a pessimist, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, because I, I think these are I think these are long, long-term trends that, that we're trying to buck here. I would say uh, a couple of things. The, uh, uh, I think Gene is, is, has his finger on things, on things right in terms of the religious community. I think for the most part, not just the evangelicals, I think that I would say this about my own Catholic tradition, I'd say it about most mainstream Protestant traditions. I think we're better at weighing in on existing debates than starting the debates. Uh, I don't think we're particularly adept at bringing things into the public agenda. But once you have something on the public agenda, then I think you find many religious leaders are willing to countenance trying to add their voice or contribute to it or make some sort of uh, you know, useful contribution. So in many ways for me, the real, the real problem is the, the uh, uh, what I would say is just this kind of passivity of Congress. You know, they have, it, it, they have punted to the presidency irrespective of party, whether it was President Bush, President uh, Obama, President Trump. Congress has become very complacent in these, in these realms. And I think part of that is, I do think the all-volunteer army is of a piece with this. Uh, it's, you know, our, our founders argued greatly over the wisdom about having a standing army, right? We came to understand we do need a standing army, but it should be a citizen's army. And increasingly, I think what's happened with the all-volunteer forces, we have a wonderful professional military, but it's allowed the rest of us to sort of say, that's their belly wick, it's not ours, and we take no responsibility or role in it. And uh, I would suggest it's little things like uh, ways of getting the public involved would be to look into, and I haven't thought through the details of this, but to look in some, into something like a mandatory war tax 
that once expenditures go beyond a certain amount of money being used for military engagement or conflict, automatically a war tax kicks in that the present generation has to pay for the wars it's countenancing, rather than fobbing it off on future generations, that we're not allowed to fight major conflicts on the, on the credit card, all right? That would at least awaken many Americans to what we're doing and give them some stake in it. I think also, uh, Gene men mentioned Andy Basevich, uh, a former military, career military man, became an historian. Uh, Basevich has suggested not resurrecting the draft for the full-time professional army, but resurrecting a draft that's inclusive and, and balanced for reservists. So that once we got into bringing in other troops in long-term and expansive commitments, then every citizen or more, more citizens have a stake in whether or not we want to pursue these long-term engagements. Keeping uniform people, the present force, intact. But once you go beyond that to try to find a way of helping non-uniformed uh, citizens realize they have a stake. The only other thing I'd say about the weapons of mass destruction is uh, the, the one hope I see here, maybe again, maybe I'm being too hopeful, but it seems to me Islamabad is finally realizing that there is an internal threat to Islamabad by some of the extreme groups in the Northwest Territories. That for so long, they saw those groups as useful in many ways to uh, engage in terrorist acts in India and to keep things unsettled in Afghanistan or move in their direction. But what they're beginning to see now is precisely that some of these radical groups, ISIS-K, would in fact be a threat to Islamabad itself. And we're seeing, as I mentioned, it was the Pakistani military and secret service that let Baradur leave his detention and enter into negotiations on behalf of the Taliban. So it may be that Pakistan is a more amenable and willing partner in some of these negotiations because now I think they see they have something at stake or at risk because of some of the more extremism that's unleashed in the Northwest Territories that they have basically accepted and allowed and even used for their own purposes. Let's try, is that a student in the back maybe? Yeah, let's try a student voice please. Um, so growing up, Afghanistan definitely was sort of a major thing in the news and, uh, you know, something that was sort of defining of my childhood and thinking of the United States. Um, but as, you know, I got older, my interest in Afghanistan certainly waned and I started to think about it less and less. And then just this summer, somebody asked me, he's like, you know, how often do you even think that we're in war with Afghanistan, that we're, that we still are at war with Afghanistan? And then I started thinking about it, and then you guys brought up that it's not um, some, you know, that it's just gone from public perception and thought. And I was wondering if why you think that is. Is it because we've just gotten bored because it's gone on so long, or we've become desensitized um, because of its length? I'm just curious. Uh, the media. Where has the media been? Yeah, a wall gone. Um, the, the media, the, at least the, the mainstream corporate media, uh, have basically lost interest in Afghanistan. Now, my, again, maybe this is not just pessimistic, this is cynical uh, about the corporate media. I think that l large sectors of the corporate media have essentially become the propaganda arm of the government. They, you know, they're supposed to be investigating, but basically their investigation consists of repeating whatever sort of uh, position paper they get from the state or defense department and then rely, relaying it to the American people as journalism. Um, so I think that uh, one of the reasons that you don't think about it a lot is you literally don't hear about it a lot. Uh, and those outlets that would provide some a better education about the military and political and economic uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan you probably don't hear about a lot because it's not mainstream. So you, you really have to dig for a lot of this information. But you're not going to get it from, my God, the three major networks or even some cable 
networks. You just, they're just not interested. I would only, I agree with the, uh, the criticism of the mainstream press on much of this. I, I, would, I would also add though, and, and here I'll reflect my age, I was, I was in college in the late 60s. Uh, I was there for the shootings on Kent State. I was there for met much of the, the protests. And uh, I have to say that uh, there was a good deal of concern about uh, the morality of the war in Vietnam. There were a great number of people who perhaps uh, were not at risk of being drafted, but uh, still cared about what was going on in Southeast Asia. But an awful lot of student activism and the activism of uh, the average young American in the late 60s was self-interested. It was, I don't want to go and die in a patty in Vietnam. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, most Americans have no risk. They have no skin in what happens to the American military. Uh, I suspect if your, your brother or sister or a cousin were, were in Afghanistan, you would have thought about it more. But the, I, I said it's less than 1% of Americans have served in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. I actually think the number is closer less, to less than one half of 1% have served. So the, the vast majority of Americans can simply, they have the freedom to ignore what we ask the military to do in our name. And uh, I just think that's you know, an unfortunate situation. And uh, that's why I think we do have to figure some ways out that we sort of ask Americans to see they have some interest in what our foreign policies are and what we're asking our military to sacrifice. And that's why I just threw out that idea of wealth taxes or you know, uh, finding some sort of draft for reserves. I'm not wedded to any of those things, but I think we cannot simply go on and continue to allow the vast majority of Americans to simply put foreign policy in general, as Gina suggested, and um, military engagements and more particularly that at someone else's agenda, it's not ours. Then, then, then we're no longer really a functioning democracy, it seems to me, in terms of citizen engagement. Excellent. I, I need to be respectful of our time, everyone. We're at our 10.15 cutoff for this session. I'd like to ask everyone to, to join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>